Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Between the Leaves. I'm Julietta Smith, and I'm here with my friends Krista Cowan, Amy Johnson Crow, and Anne Gillespie Mitchell. And today we're going to do something a little bit fun. We want to talk a little bit about questions you would ask, kind of a phone calls from heaven kind of thing, if you will. We want to, questions you would ask your ancestor if you had the opportunity to talk to them. So I want to get started because I found something not too long ago that was really interesting. I was going at, working on my tree and I got this little shaky leaf. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a marriage record from Cleveland, Ohio. And it's from my great grandparents, which is awesome because I've been looking for it a long, long time. In Philadelphia, though. So that's something we need to know. Um, but it's from 1915. And what really brings up the questions is um, this is the family in 1915. I don't know if you can see that, but there's chillins there. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's up? <laughs> but what I think, it's just really interesting. It also told me, it, thank you, Julia. I want to tell you, this, this is Julia and John Mikowski. Um, but I want to thank you for your parents' names, including mother's maiden name. Awesome. Um, also, for this previous marriage, Julia, or Julianne as you are in here, um, Mr. Christawa, and it says D.I.V. after it. I was not aware of a divorce. That is a little story that Grandma took to the grave. Ooh. Well, she didn't completely take it to the grave, did she? Not completely. So, okay, you know, I don't judge. I don't judge. <laughs> and I will be discreet. But I would like to know a little bit more about this and why this marriage was taking place so late. Um, was there a hiccup in the divorce proceedings? Or maybe you lost your original record and you needed this for some sort of proof? Um, one interesting thing, and kind of a, to take it down a somber note, uh, Julia died two years after this of cancer. So I'm wondering, did this have to do with insurance? You needed to prove marriage? Um, a lot of questions there. Could you help me out? <laughs> Thoughts, you guys? <laughs> no, nothing? Sure. Nothing. Okay. Well, and also, if there are any sucruses out there, there are not many of you. I'm going to pull on uh, Amy. My handle's right down there at the bottom. <laughs> Tweet me if there are any other sucruses out there. So Someday this will work for us. Yeah. Okay, one day, yes. Someday. Someday. <laughs> anyway, that was my that's my big burning question right now, or at least one of them. What do you got, Ann? One question? Seriously? You think that we all don't have more than one question? I mean, and there's the obvious things, like Charlton Wallace. Who were your parents? But I think if I could really just talk to one ancestor, I'd want to know more than that, right? I have a third great grandfather. His name was Nicholas Snavely, and he married Molly Pickle. Love that name. Nice. Right? <laughs> It would be like, okay, so who were your in-laws? But it would be more questions also, like his father died when he was about 13 or 14. What was that like? How did your family survive? You know, there was a good-sized family. He was one of six children, one sister, four brothers. What happened to you guys? And when you look at the records in his life, he looks like he was a very nice man. He was always deeding things to people, whether it be a pony to his grandchildren, or he always had extra people staying in the household, random nieces, nephews, grandchildren. And it struck me that he was just a nice, caring person, or maybe it was Molly who was the nice, caring person. I don't really know. But what drove you to be the person who felt the need to take everybody in? Was it because you lost your father when you were very young? Was it someone else who, you know, who, was, who were the people that made an impression on your life? What was it like living in southwestern rural Virginia? What was it like growing up there? What did you all do for fun? What was, what was entertaining and, and different about your life? How, how did things change? What was it like to lose one of your sons in the Civil War? All those things, what were the things that made you feel as a person and develop who you were. And because I've researched him so much, if I could just talk to him, wouldn't it be great just to talk to one of them for 15 minutes, just to get yeah. that feel of who they were as a person, because that is a lot of, what I think, what we miss. So for me, he would be the first I have ever, so. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, Krista? 
Well, for me, you know, if, if I have to narrow it down to one, and, you know, as, as much as I would love to talk to any of my grandparents, you know, like you say, just, just give me 15 minutes. 15 minutes more with any of my grandparents, that would just be beyond awesome. But if we're looking, you know, beyond the grandparents, the one ancestor, and I'm going to be good and narrow it down to just one, it would have to be my, my ever elusive Matilda de Bolt Skinner Cross and Brown McFillin. I mean, <laughs> I have one more time. One more time, Amy. You got to give us that one more time. One more time. <laughs> Matilda de Bolt Skinner, Cross and Brown McFillin. And I'm not even sure that McFillin is her last husband. Okay, this is my third great grandmother. The thing is, she's not my brick wall because I know her parents. I've, I've got like two or three generations beyond her, but she just she jumps around. Every time I find her, she's married or not married to somebody else. Um, I descend from the first husband. He's the only one I've been able to kill off. He died in 1850 in Perry County, Ohio. He was nice enough to die and shows up on the mortality schedule. So thank you, William Skinner. That was awesome of you. I appreciate it. But back to Matilda, the Bolt Skinner Cross of Bromacfillin, and the list of questions I have for her. <laughs> They're written okay. down. <laughs> Amy, for the call. She's got to be prepared. Exactly. Amy, Amy, I don't think the actual call is coming, sweetie. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Ready. I'm got, I am prepared. This is part of being organized. This, this is my attempted organization. Okay. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, question number one: Was J. W. McFillin your last husband? I think that's a good question. That's a good question. It is a good question. Okay, number two. What in the world was J.W.'s first name? He shows up as J.W. McFillin on both the civil marriage record and in the family Bible. Really? Even in the family Bible, you couldn't give him a first name. Come maybe on. Maybe he didn't have one. And maybe not, but I would like to know that. Okay. Okay, and by the way, question number three, which this maybe should be question number one. Um, what happened to husbands two through four? <laughs> you know, no, what happened no to Cross and Brown and McFillin? I can't find them dying or you divorcing them anywhere. So there's a reason I call this woman the, the Mary Widow, but maybe not. Okay. Question number four. Why do you keep showing up in the census as Matilda Skinner? Yeah. Yeah. Even, even after she's married these other men, every census... She's by herself and goes back to using Skinner. Okay, maybe she's a liberated woman. I don't know, but possibly. Possibly. And um, why in the world do you keep moving? Every time I find you in a census, you are in a different county. Maybe I'm, guessing, the, I'm guessing those at missing husbands might have something to do with that. <laughs> That. It's like, is she out running the law? Is she out running the tax man? I mean, she goes from Perry County, Ohio, to Jay County, Indiana, to Lake County, Indiana, up up by up by you, Julie. <laughs> yeah, I know. Maybe she, maybe that's. I, I need to come visit you. There you um, go. So, so she goes from Perry County, Ohio, to Jay County, Indiana, to Lake County, Indiana, to Williams County, Ohio, and that's where I lose her. Well, conveniently, Lake County, Indiana is home to Crown Point, which was a marriage mill for quite a while. So maybe there's... <laughs> there you go. There, yeah. And then the, the last question, when and where did you die? I'd like to know that. I mean, presuming, you know, if this is a call from heaven, she should be able to give me that information. Absolutely. Are we exactly. sure all these so, people are in heaven? I'm not 100% <laughs> Okay, I'm willing to give... Well, now this one... We're not judging. I'm not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, judging. We're not judging. No, We're not judging. No judging. So, yeah, okay. Those those are most of my questions for Matilda, DeBolt, Skinner, Cross, and Brown McFillin. Delightful. You, <laughs> so, um, if I could talk to one ancestor again, or at all... Um, I think I would talk to my grandfather. I knew him. He actually just died about 13 years ago. But um, I don't want to find information out from him. I want to share information with him. 
So I I just I think about him every single time I discover something new in his family tree because he um he, <coughs> he was born and raised in uh, California born in San Francisco, raised in Los Angeles, lived there his whole life. Um, he's one of three children, and his father was an, an army recruiter, and, and so once he got uh, made an army recruiter, they stayed there in L.A. Uh, but his grandmother actually moved to New Orleans from Ohio to help raise um, my grandfather's cousins. And so he met his own grandmother like once his whole life, and he never really knew his cousins. And I remember growing up, him talking about how he wanted to know what happened to her, and he wanted to know what happened to those cousins. And so for years, I looked for that information. It was, it, it was the biggest brick wall I had, because all four of his first cousins were girls. And so we knew, of course, their maiden name, Cowan, but, and we knew their birth dates. He had that recorded, but we didn't know who they married. And so I had Google alerts and message board postings. <laughs> you know, I, did, I did everything I could think of to do from the time I was a teenager through my 20s. Um, and when he passed away, I still hadn't solved that mystery. And just two years ago, I actually got a Google alert on one of the, the last one of those four girls died, and her obituary was posted, and I got a Google alert on it. And in her obituary, it listed all of her children and some of her grandchildren, and I contacted them on Facebook. And uh, last year, year, two years ago, I got to take my dad to New Orleans, and we met this family, and they shared pictures and stories Aww. about my dad, or about my grandpa's grandmother, and what happened to the family. And it was just, we just, it was so cool to get that piece of the story, right? Um, right. I just really, really, really wish I could share that with my grandpa. <laughs> I just have to believe he knows, Krista. Uh, I know. I but, yeah. If anyone's in heaven, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, right? So there you go. But that, that's good. So, but, yeah, so that Google Alert message board postings, those things work, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd love so, to talk to my grandma, too, but I have a feeling she might have a few words for me after sharing that story. <laughs> The Google Alerts is a good idea, and I'm going to go add some more of those in. So, can I sneak another phone call in? Do we have time? Sure. Tell me. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would also talk to my great grandfather, Wyatt Paul Gillespie, because there's a bunch of stuff I want to know from him. One, he married my great grandmother, but a year before that, he filed for a marriage license with another woman and it was returned not used but she was still alive and married somebody else later what up right so right. what was that all about and then the runaway bride. and then with his family supposedly his parents were first cousins is that true and why did his father never serve in the civil war when all the rest of them did and just the whole family that's sort of the darker side of the family so what are the secrets, right? There, I know there are a whole lot of secrets there because there's a whole lot of darkness and strangeness there, and I want to know what the story is. So, yeah, okay, I'm going to say he's in heaven. I'm just going to think happy, positive thoughts. But <laughs> what, what is going on there, right? What is the story of your family? I, love, I love that whole idea of... You know, we're not just putting down names and dates. Like, the stories is what intrigues all of us, right? Yeah, so, right. You know, Amy mentioned that great-grandmother. That's not her brick wall. She can keep going back. But you want to know about them and their lives. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and what would possess this woman to continue to marry, you know, so many times? It's not like she still had small children to, to help raise. I mean, it just... Maybe she enjoyed the whole marriage thing. How do you know that all of them died? How I do you don't. Know? That's the thing. She could have been a bigamist, polygamist. Well, I don't know that she was, well... No. <laughs> I don't I'm just ready to accept that yet, Ann. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's... Anything with this woman, it would not surprise me, really. But yeah, maybe maybe she was just what they call a grass widow. Yeah. <laughs> you, are you familiar with the term a grass widow? <laughs> the a grass widow. Find people. Yeah, a, a grass widow was a, a polite way of saying that your husband had abandoned you. 
that he had just basically walked off into the grass and was never heard from again. And in, in many states, if he had abandoned you for a certain period of time, then, then you could file for divorce and, and get a divorce in absentia. But I've never even seen that. So, hmm, yeah. <laughs> Maybe she was like one of my ancestors. Her son-in-law um, used to tell people that she died of a bad disposition. So maybe that there's something to that. Keep walking on. She died of a bad well, disposition. Well. You know what? Yeah. The whole marital status thing though is really interesting to me. So this same great grandmother that moved down to New Orleans, her husband actually did that. He just walked off and left her and her two small boys. And uh, for the next two censuses, she listed herself as widowed. Right, yeah. And yeah. because she didn't want to claim being divorced. Yeah, <laughs> there was some stigma I, attached to that. I've I've seen that more mm -hmm. than once in my family tree, where they will say widow or widower, and then yeah, yeah. yeah. Or actually, in one case, I have um, a great great grandfather who appears twice in 1910, once with his wife, and once in Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> Who so was living with him in Idaho? Well, I was just going to ask he that. He was in a boarding house. He was in a boarding house at the time, but there are rumors in the family that he married house. someone. And his wife died, and then after the wife died in 1912, he came back and he, you know, helped finish raising the kids and everything. But and so there, I guess there wasn't another wife, unless he left her too. I don't know. <laughs> So I guess the question is to make this genealogical, right? You know, I have this grandmother who's listed as widowed when really she was divorced. You have the guy appearing twice in a census. How do you resolve that information? Like, what, what do you do with that information to figure out the truth? Sometimes you may never get the answer, but court records obviously would be a good place to start. Maybe some newspapers. <laughs> um, Go ahead. Yeah, and I found my particular one uh, by going through city directories because uh, one of the they were living in a bigger city so I figured if I kept going through city directories I could place the date of death for the husband right because it usually lists you as widow of so and so but that never really happened and then I was finding them in different places so just and this is the same thing back to the previous um, marriage for my great grandfather just because you find them in one data collection don't stop searching go search for them Again, yeah. just because you find them in 1860, don't assume that's the only place they're listed. I know a lot of people are like, I can barely find them in once, but <laughs> never assume that just one hit in a data collection is all there is, because you'd be amazed at what you might find, like, you know, we've been talking about. Right, and with um, the one that was in Idaho, another thing to consider, too, and I was at the shiny side, but he was a jeweler, and... Idaho's big for mining, so the gem state. So maybe there was a business thing, maybe he took away. We, we have the family story that there was a little bit of discord <laughs> in the family, so maybe he just went away on business for a while, and it just so happened that it was two years, and his wife died in the interim, and he came back. So who knows? We, there's a lot of things that sometimes we just may not find the actual, you know, the real reasons, but a lot of times we can fill in if we keep searching. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. With my great grandmother, you know, just because she's listed as widowed, that's not going to preclude a search for her husband in the same census living somewhere else. Um, no. You're searching death records, or for divorce records, or for right. You sometimes have to think outside, outside of the box that the census takers create for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I had it with actually it not just a marital, but I had a, um, a great great my third great grandmother. She was in 1860. She's listed with one of her sons. She's 86 years old. 1870. She's gone. So. Natural assumption, she's probably passed on. She would have been 96. Well, I find a death reference to her in the Barber Collection, which is the New York Times Index, and it's in 1873. So I went back and looked for her in 1870, and I found her by herself. She was almost she was 99 years old in Blackwell Island. <laughs> so she was in the, um, actually it said the penitentiary, which kind of gave me pause. <laughs> But when I scrolled forward, it said that she was in the Alms House, I think, and then I actually found the records of admission at the Family History Library, and she was in the Home for Incurables. So, uh, you know, 
they were a family of hatters. Surprising, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and she, they were a family of hatters too, and you know that whole mad at is a hatter because of the mercury. So very likely that you know she su suffered from dementia or something. Yeah. So, so yeah, keep looking. <laughs> the whole idea, right, of the reasonably exhaustive search is even if you find a document that proves your theory, go out and look for one that might disprove it. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I'll probably spend just as much time trying to disprove the information I found as I do trying to prove it. It's a different mm -hmm. way to look at it. Yeah, it yeah. is. And if you're trying to break a brick wall, come up with a theory and then try and go disprove it. And that's a really good idea that Krista had that you want to go try and disprove everything that you've already found because that will help you stumble across new stuff. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, that was fun, ladies. Uh, anybody got anything else to add? Any more phone calls? Yeah, we phone can keep calls, back. Come on. Phone calls all night. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. Um, we'd like to hear from you when you see this video. Why don't you share some of the phone calls that you'd like to make in the comments? Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, ladies. Bye.